Hi everyone, and welcome to Burning Questions uh, by Artsy Creator. My name is Nabila Said. I am the editor of Artsy Creator, and we'll slowly be joined by the moderator. We, we are joined by the moderator, but we'll slowly be joined by the other speakers as well. But firstly, uh, some important announcements. If you are in the Zoom session with us today, welcome. We request that you keep your video or, uh, and audio off throughout the whole session. And this session is actually being recorded and the video will be made available later on. Uh, this session is also being live streamed on howround.com, which is a theatre commons with a worldwide audience. So today we are also joined by audiences watching on the HowlRound website, as well as their Facebook page as well. Um, there, there are some Zoom instructions which might make your the viewing of this experience a little bit better. The main thing is, um, besides turning on gallery view for the best viewing experience, is to also click hide non-video participants um, under your meeting, uh, under your uh, video settings. So I think Denise has popped the instructions in your live uh, in the chat. So you can take a look at that uh, and it, it'll make your experience a bit better. Um, just to introduce everyone to Artsy Creator, in case we have any kind of new people uh, here, we are a regional digital media platform that is dedicated to covering the arts in Singapore as well as Southeast Asia, and you can find us on artsycreator.com. Burning Questions is uh, a new, well, newish uh, series of talks which attempts to ask some very big questions. So the idea is to have kind of regional voices come and discuss some of these things that may be on our minds, but um, we might have we might not have a platform to talk about these things uh, on like a usual day. Um, so during this time when we are all affected by this pandemic, we, we are here to kind of draw connections between each other. And the idea is that even though it's called burning questions, we, we are not really here to un, uh, like find the answers, you know, but to kind of slowly figure out what's happening uh, and really find connections. Lah. This series is supported by Splice Lights On uh, with live stream support by HowlRound TV. Um, so if, if any of you join us for our first two panels, and this is your third one, congrats. Uh, but if anyone has missed the first two panels, we've actually put up the videos on our Artsy Creator Facebook, uh, sorry, Artsy Creator website. And I think we will be sharing the links to those two, um, those two videos later on in the chat. Uh, today you're joining us for the third panel in this series. It's called, Is There Still Hope for Integrity and Intimacy in Online Performance? I think everyone's very excited about that. Uh, just a quick note about Q&A. We will keep it to the last 30 minutes of this session. But at any time, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Zoom chat and we'll uh, try and address them maybe towards the end of the session. For anyone who's watching the live stream, you can actually put your questions in the Facebook chat as well. We will monitor those and we'll try our best to address all the questions that we get. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, that's enough from me. I will now leave you with Corey as well as our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today and thank you Nadella for the introduction. We're really excited to have all of you here with us um, together with an incredible panel who I'll just introduce in a little bit. Um, so as Nabila's um, introduced, our, our burning question for today is, is there hope for integrity and intimacy in online performance? Um, and a kind of provocation I think that the, the four of us were given as a panel was this paragraph which is that artists today have to grapple with being true to their creative integrities while dealing with the limitations of tech platforms and live delivery methods. With social distancing and restrictions on travel worldwide, is there a way to keep the intimacy alive between artists and their audiences in a way that doesn't compromise the work? Um, and in our, we had a little conversation yesterday, and we've been kind of uh, talking about this over email for the past couple of weeks. And I wanted to maybe just highlight before we, we um, go into each presentation by the panelists, two words that we kind of plucked out from this provocation, which was intimacy um, and integrity. Um, and when you think of the int intimacy or the intimate, um, and I was thinking about this in the several languages of the countries um, that we come from and also that I speak or our panelists speak, um, that we, when we think of intimate in Chinese, tinmi, or in, in Indonesian, intim. Um, in Filipino, we had a bit of discussion about this. It could be lapid, which is closeness, um, or it could be bagnini, which is kind of a really heartfelt, deep conversation, close conversation between people. Um, and you get a sense that intimacy is to, is to come close to, um, to be deeply familiar 
um, to take place in, in maybe a private personal space perhaps, um, but in a, in a funny way, in a paradoxical kind of way, to be intimate or to intimate um, also means to make known, right? To, to reveal maybe in a more oblique way, like someone intimates that they're in love with you. Um, so intimacy has an interesting kind of blend of, of um, definitions. Um, and then on the other hand, we have integrity. Um, and, and we were thinking about this in a variety of ways as well. So, so maybe thinking about what does it mean to have for a work or for something that we built to have structural integrity, um, to be whole, to be intact, to be sound in construction. Um, of course, integrity also has um, the meaning of reflecting qualities of honesty, of ethics, um, of credibility, right? So, so there are many kind of nuances and shades to um, the terms intimacy and integrity that we'll all be exploring today. Um, and, and the panelists will definitely um, be sharing a, a variety of how intimacy and integrity relates to their work um, in how their work, whether it has adapted to the online public sphere or had already um, found a home there. Um, these might be intimacies in terms of relationship building, um, the forging of new partnerships, um, the ways they've connected with your audiences or readerships, um, how they've been testing out what it feels like to sit shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow in a performance space and you can feel the person next to you breathing or laughing or crying. What does this feel like online? Um, but also I think we'll, uh, the, the panel will address um, what it means to retain those structural and foundational integrities of their artistic and cultural practice, even if the way their practice unfolds may now take a different shape or different form. Um, so how this will go is that um, each of the panelists will present um, a little bit about the work that they've been doing in their own cultural and um, regional context. So this will be about maybe 10 to 12 minutes per person where they'll look at um, some key studies um, and, and then after that, I'll pose a couple of questions to, to the whole panel. And then in the final 20 to 30 minutes, um, we'll, we'll take questions for the audience. Like Abila said, feel free to post your questions in the chat. Um, and the Arts Creative team will compile them and we'll get to go through them, whether on Facebook or on the Zoom platform. Um, and now um, it's my great pleasure to introduce these three amazing women um, from all over Southeast Asia that we have here today. It's really such an honor for the three of you here with us. Um, first of all, I wanted to introduce Bernice Lee. Um, she's a dance artist from Singapore. Her practice is quite extensive. She sees art making as a form of social activism. Um, her labors are rooted in improvisation, um, in playing in connection between thought, feeling and movement. Her love of language has led to her writing about dance, as well as working with poets and spoken word artists. Bernice has a current practice called ghosting. Um, you can find it hashtag ghosting if you follow at B-L-E-E-L-L-Y on Instagram. Um, it's a dance research of practicing the female gaze, not as one way of seeing, um, but as many ways of seeing. Um, and she's also an associate member of Dance Nucleus, a part-time lecturer at La Salle in Singapore, and she teaches dance for really an extraordinary range of populations from preschoolers, um, children with autism, teenagers, older dancers, and she'll be sharing a bit um, more about this um, um, in, in her presentation later. I thought it'd be nice to maybe also um, talk about my intimate connections with each of these three women. Um, I'm Bernice's dramaturg <laughs> for her piece, Tech Therapy Studies, that she works on with um, another Singaporean practitioner, Chong Waki, and it's been such a pleasure working with the both of them. Um, from Manila, we have Katrina Stuart Santiago. Um, she's an independent cultural critic and opinion writer um, with a decade of work in print and online. Her critical work in theater, film, visual arts, and popular culture has been published um, in Rebellions, Notes on Independence and Romances, Variations on Love by the Ateneo de Naga University Press in 2017. Her role as a critic has fueled her activism, which cuts across issues of cultural labor, systemic dysfunctions and institutional crises. She is also a contributing writer for the CNN Philippines, and she's a teacher of multimedia arts at the College of St. Benilt School of Design and the Arts. Um, she maintains a number of websites. I don't know how you do it, Katrina. Um, the review website, gaslight.online, the opinion page, disquiet.ph, and she's been writing at um, katrinasantiago.com since 2008. She's the founder of PAGASA, which stands for People for Accountable Governance and Sustainable Action, which she will share a bit more about later, which seeks to build a new civil society for the urgencies of the present. I think um, I met Katrina in 2010 or 2011, and we journeyed around Manila together 
in, in snarls or traffic jams trying to go to different art galleries and it was an incredible time and I have a deep respect for the work she does as a critic. Um, and finally, um, from Indonesia, um, we have Maria Aria of Paper Moon Puppet Theatre. She founded the theatre which is based in Jakarta in Indonesia um, in 2006. Um, she didn't have any educational background of puppetry and so making puppetry for her is a never-ending experimental journey. Um, she's a co-director of Paper Moon along with her husband, the visual artist Iwan Effendi. And Paper Moon makes performances, visual arts projects, and facilitates workshops with a wide range of audiences. Um, since 2008, um, they also run the independent annual international biennial puppet festival called Festa Boneca. Um, and I had such uh, the pleasure of uh, getting to watch Muatirika, which is a non-verbal uh, puppet piece by Paper Moon that looks at the Indonesian genocide of 1965, a really incredible, powerful piece um, that was staged here in Singapore, I think in 2012. Um, so these are our three panelists. Um, so right now we'll, we'll start with Bernice, who will share a little bit about her practice, um, and then we'll take it away from there. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for joining us. Bernice, over to you. I need to unmute myself. OK. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Corey, for that very elaborate um, introduction and also it's great to be on this panel with um, Katrina and Ria. Um, we've never met before <laughs> so I guess this is a form of digital intimacy for us. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll just launch directly into what I've been doing during this time. Um, so in Singapore we call it the circuit breaker and then now we're phase one, phase two. Um, and there are different rules um, for how we can behave in public space. Um, and what, sorry. And what I'm showing here on the left is um, when I tried to be an infographic. So um, I guess every most people in Singapore would be aware that there was the um, Straits Times article um, with an infographic of an artist that looked like this, and then there were these statistics. Um, that, that showed that 71% of the respondents thought that um, artists were non-essential. And of course, there was a whole unraveling discourse around that. Um, I won't go into it, but for me, my response was to be humorous. Um, I think it's a coping mechanism in general, but especially in this time. Um, so I just tried to be an infographic. And then the picture in the middle is of me um, on day two of Doscorn Orange. So this was before everybody was a lot more cautious and anxious. Um, this was kind of when maybe I would say 10% of the people I knew were very, very careful and 90% of the people I knew were like, yeah, okay, you know, we're not sure where this is going and Doscorn Orange. Then everyone's like, oh, all right. So I took this picture of myself. Um, I used orange lipstick um, to draw a mask. Um, and it's um, something that I, like these things just um, happen because I dream and think about different ways of being myself. Um, and this image came to mind. Um, and the picture is very much a way of me thinking about my practice of ghosting. So it's one of the manifestations of ghosting and it's published on published on Instagram. Um, and ghosting is basically something I've been... Oh, wait, sorry. Could we go back one more time? Yeah. Um, ghosting is something I've been doing officially since 2018 and hashtag ghosting is also on Instagram. And it's just my way of thinking about what it is to be a dance artist for me, and I'll go into more of that later. And then the third picture is me playing the professor of dance. Um, it's a tongue-in-cheek title. I am not a professor of dance. Um, I don't think, yeah, I'm not. <laughs> um, and it's for the Elbow Show by Roly Poly Family. And Roly Poly Family is the wing, family-friendly wing of Daring Do Dance, which I run with Fei Lim. Um, and you can see the show, the elbow show on um, YouTube. Um, yeah, I'll just put it that much. Then we'll go to the next slide. Thanks. 
Thanks, Denise. Um, okay, so this is a picture of me um, in a live performance in 2019. And I called it Ghosting Indelible in the Hippocampus. Indelible in the Hippocampus um, as a quote um, from Christine Blasey Ford during the um, Brett Kavanaugh trials um, in the US. I won't go too much into that, but essentially what I wanted to show here was that there's this, I made this live performance um, coming out of my practice of ghosting. Um, and in the live performance, I invite audience to record me using their own mobile phones um, in a black box theater. And I also set up my laptop as part of the performance to record myself. So um, it's a manifestation of what I've been thinking about. So um, ghosting is a word that I started using for my practice in 2018, but it's just really a way of how I think about um, my way of being in the world my whole life. So um, it's not really, it's more like trying to define what is happening already rather than making up something new. And then because I named it, certain things started to come up. Um, so I always felt my whole life that I'm constantly doing something and disappearing moment to moment. Um, and maybe that's something that's also relevant because I'm primarily um, coming from performing as a performer. Um, and for me, like there's something quite um, essential about the transientness of being alive and you know sharing live space with people. Um, even right now, I like to think about the fact that there are 42 people out there plus how round I don't know how many people like being in the space and time at the same time in this universe. Anyway, <laughs> so and it's a word that I use and it's also something that I use because of the monstrous feminine trope. Um, the idea that many fantasies of ghosts are feminine and that there is something monstrous about femininity and it's something that I like to play with. Um, and then over time, of like as I practiced this, I started to understand it more and more as a danced research of the female gaze, which Corey quoted from my um, bio. Um, and it's just really simple. It's like uh, rather than thinking of it as one way of seeing, but as many ways of seeing. So, I mean, we can think about it in opposition to the male gaze, where it's about acquisition or possession, perhaps. Um, whereas for me, the female gaze isn't something that's practiced by females. It's just a way of seeing the world. Um, and it's for me quite essential to my approach to making art and to dancing in general. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and for me, this idea that I can have many ways of seeing, even though I just have two eyes, has like a kind of uh, monstrosity. And, and I, I like thinking about that and this feeling that I have more than one self. And I think this is exaggerated by the digital media medium, right? Um, and I think lots of people engage with the internet and with social media in different ways. And for me, I try and do it as consciously and as much as a performance as I can, um, or at least to be very conscious of its performativity, that every time I post something, it does something or it reaches out to someone, um, someone might respond. Um, I think there are people here who do it a lot more prolifically um, and probably also think about this. Um, yeah, and then also there's the Urban Dictionary description that I find quite fun, but it's not really what I was focused on. Yeah, so I think that's just kind of the gist of what I was thinking about for my practice of ghosting. And it's something that I started doing more in 2018, like posting on social media, because otherwise I wouldn't be on Instagram at all, I think. Um, it's not really in my personality, I think, to do it. Um, but um, when then everybody started flooding the performance space of the digital realm with videos of themselves dancing and dancing at home, it was a bit of a shock for me because suddenly I felt like my questions had to shift um, because I was thinking about what it means to dance domestically, what that means as a woman, what that means for me 
as a woman who had just moved into a new home and like not being a domestic goddess at all and not feeling like the home is really my space in the same way that my mother, my mother's in-law see the home like as really their space and they really take care of it. I'm not so good at taking care of my home space. Um, so it was just something that I had to kind of pause for a while in terms of my practice um, on Instagram. Um, but then one of the first, thing that, first things that I did was a dance party fundraiser. Um, and this fundraiser page was actually started for, like I started this personal fundraiser page for AWARE on the last day of, on the day of this show. So in this picture, this was July 2019. I just decided, okay, I'll start a personal fundraiser page. Totally no plan, just bleh, create it. Um, raised like a few hundred dollars, didn't really try very hard. Um, it was just like, okay, I have this thing. And then when Circuit Breaker happened, or lockdown, whatever you want to call it, in Singapore, then I was thinking a lot about all the women, well, not just women, but all the people who would be facing um, domestic violence at home, where the home space is not a safe space. Um, and I started thinking about the way in which I can use the things that I've been thinking about and um, just do something really small. So I raised funds um, for using the anti-viral dance party. I had people put some money through the personal fundraiser page. Um, and we had a few dance parties at home. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, where people from different parts of my life and sometimes people that I don't know, so friends of friends, joined in. Sometimes there were a couple of people who came in, I think, because of AWARE's publicity for this. Um, and there were, a few, there were a few interesting moments of existentialism, you know, when you go to a club and you're like just kind of dancing nonstop for half an hour and kind of get lost. And it was really interesting in the context of an online dance party in this time, there's a kind of absurdism to it. Um, yeah, but also there's this feeling that, okay, we're doing this thing and it's supposed to be a good thing because we're raising funds. Um, so I tried to make something useful and fun and artistically kind of in line with things that I'm curious about. Yeah, so then the second thing that I kind of, the second thing that I did as a digital performance is called Touch You Later. Um, sorry, we have to go back a few slides, Denise. Um, and Touch You Later comes out of my work with Guaki. Um, we've been working on a piece, it's a live piece called Tactility Studies, um, and that's with Corey as dramaturg. And then on the top right corner here, you see Joseph Nair. Um, and his little, I think that's a puppy toy. Um, this was from our first run of um, Touch You Later. Um, and Joe is an artistic pres a creative presence in the work. Um, anyway, so Touch You Later was really a first response to touchlessness. Um, it was something that we did also because of the closure of 77 Center 42. Um, and we wanted to say see you later, but instead of see you later, touch you later. Um, and it was something that we decided we would test out. Um, also, partly, interestingly enough, because of a comment that I saw Nabila make. So Nabila Syed, who um, saw one of our work in progress showings last year, um, suddenly, like, I don't know why, posted on IG stories, like this question about what does, you know, what does touch mean in this time? And hey, maybe this is a question for tactility studies. And I saw that and I thought, oh yeah, she's right. <laughs> so thanks, Mamila. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, Touch You Later um, is a digital performance. It is not the same work as tactility studies at all. Um, if you go up one slide, you can see some pictures <laughs> you can see some pictures um, from tactility studies. Oh, uh, previous. Sorry, I was not very organized here. Yes, so you can see that the live show has a lot of actual touching between performer and audience. Some of it is very, very intimate and connected. 
Um, some of it can feel very strange. Some of it can feel almost dangerous in the sense like when I see, this is Myra Lok holding a cushion behind her head. When I see that picture, I feel like there could be something potentially menacing about it. Um, so, so we're playing with these ambiguities in the show. And for Touch You Later, I think the ambiguities were very different. Um, there was an ambiguity about how we felt about our relationship to each other through the screen. And we had all these things about, you know, ah ha 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 ha, let's touch soft toys in our house, let's um, copy each other's movement, let's touch our screens and, you know, try and connect with each other through the lens um, with a recognition that it's not the same, um, that we're just all trying to make sense of this at this time. Um, and But at the same time that there is a connection that we can make through the lens and through the screen. Um, and one of the rules for Touch You Later was that people had to keep their cameras on without virtual background. So there was a recognition that people have to feel comfortable enough to share with a small group of strangers um, uh, their domestic space, which is not something that we normally do, but in these times it's become normalized and we were playing with that. Yeah, okay, then I'll just move on now to the last thing. I know I need to end. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so um, the other thing that I've done as an online performance is Garak ABC. It was um, something that Safra supported. Um, and it's based on a live performance called Letters Come Alive by Roly Poly Family. And it's a really short, well, mm, it's a dance theatre piece where children are invited to be curious about the relationship of letters to bodies and letters to meaning making um, and letters to the sense that we can invent words and we can invent modes of communication. Um, and then when we created Grab ABC, um, it was coming out of the first piece with the recognition that we're trying to make something bilingual um, and I'm not Malay speaking at all I'm, um, and neither is my collaborator Faye, but we invited Dalifa Sharil and Shima Saptu to work with us on this piece. Um, and then instead of doing a live show first, we had to make an online show first and we used it as a chance to experiment with the possibilities of the camera. And it was really challenging as performers to create a sense of intimacy um, with an invisible audience. But I think that there was something about trying to project to a camera and expecting that it will be received in a way that um, and trusting that even though we couldn't see the audience, that they were there and they were engaged. Um, I think that was very uh, a very um, kind of a training mechanism for a performer. Um, and so we hopefully will get to finish the live version of the work, um, Garak ABC, when times are different. Um, so that one came out of a practical, came out of a practical consideration, but it was also something that we were prepared for, um, partly because my um, collaborator Faye um, is a is a young mom, so we often work digitally, just because um, of child caring needs, uh, caregiving needs, um, we have to figure out ways to work together and you know, toggling all these um, schedules. Yeah, so I just have these three main examples of um, ways that I've been dealing with this time in, in my practice. Um, and I think that this, this, ha this has been a really rich time for thinking about the continuity and embracing the continuity between being a live body and a digital body and to really accept them as... Um, part of our reality, you know, today, but maybe for a long time already.
I'll just end there. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Gwyneth, for your presentation. I think what really struck me was um, the kind of digital presence or digital experiments you were already doing with your work prior to this point with ghosting, um, with finding out this new physical vocabulary that you wanted to experiment around the female gaze. Um, and then it becomes a lot more heightened in focus when we come into the pandemic period where you're rethinking or adapting existing work, um, like technology studies where you'd actually be, you know, touched in, in person um, for the performance piece and then touch you later um, addresses what it means to be um, intimate in a very different way because you're all in domestic spaces, mm -hmm. your homes are revealed, um, audience, members, audience members have to think about um, um, the spaces that they move through, how much they want to reveal, how much they would prefer to obscure. So a lot of these new negotiations are taking place within the realm of the home. And I found it very interesting that you also talked about um, how much femininity is associated with domesticity. And I think this is a very kind of historical thread where, you know, the, the polis of the public sphere is the domain of, of the man, and then the oikos of the private sphere is the domain of the woman. And how do we subvert that a little bit in thinking about um, these notions of, of intimacy and, and touch salvation? in performance. So thank you very much for sharing. Um, audience members, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll definitely see them. So don't you don't have to like save your questions for the end. You can start posting them now if you like and we'll get to them later. So thank you very much, Bernice. Um, next we'll have Katrina um, to share a bit of her work with us. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? I'm good. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm Katrina from Manila in the Philippines and it in the beginning, when I was invited to do this panel, I actually thought I was going to be talking about my work as a critic and what I thought about the ways in which intimacy and integrity were navigated by um, online performances as they have been mounted here um, until I realized that they wanted me to talk about my own work as a critic in Manila. And I think um, it was a pretty important moment to be told that this was a performance in itself. Um, I think we we pretty much agreed on the idea of the critic as performer when we all did the Arts Media Roundtable um, with Arts Equator, I think last year. Right? Um, and, and since then, I've been trying to flesh out this role that I think critics play, not just here in this country, but also in the region. And fleshing it out a little more for this talk has brought me to this point where I do think that much of it is an act of intimacy because criticism is really wearing your heart on your sleeve. And in a, in a region like Southeast Asia where the critic is also intricately tied to the sectors that she critiques, then there is no way to even do it from a distance, you know, I, we can try to pretend that we do it from a distance, but at some point you become familiar with the people who do the work and the intimacy becomes default. And so on the one hand, criticism as performance is in fact a performance of intimacy to begin with, I think. Um, and then we both, I've always thought that it was also an act of activism. It was my kind of activism. And in the years that I've done critical work talking about other people's works in theater and film and um, in visual arts, I realized that it is that very distinct um, space of activism that also has allowed me to build upon credibility and integrity as a critic. And so it's all quite interwoven into my work as a critic in Manila. Um, and of course, and I know Kari has heard me say this too many times. I think criticism is an act of hope. And so I think that it's something that I've continued to do because I do think that it's necessary. I do think that when we critique other people's works and especially our own, it's an admission that we want to do better or that it can be better. And so we hope for better in the process of actually critiquing um, not just uh, cultural texts, but also just society in general, which I feel is where we all are at this point. And so in that sense, I didn't really shift from doing cultural work as a critic to doing 
activism and advocacy work through PAGASA, which is the organization I put up in March in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic. But more of it seems now to me like just a continuation of that practice. It almost seems like there would have been no other way for me to deal with the pandemic and the kind of injustice and inequality it surfaced in the, con in the Philippines in particular, other than to do something like this one. Now, PAGASA is People for Accountable Governance and Sustainable Action, and it is farthest from actually doing analysis of cultural work. Um, and so, and yet at the same time, I think people sort of expected me to do it, and no one was in the least bit surprised that I did. Um, and it started with just me sending a message to close friends who were on Telegram and who I felt were also looking for a way to help out at such a time when we were all on lockdown. So this is like the version of Circuit Breaker, but worse because in the Philippines, it also means you have military checkpoints all over and there is absolutely no excuse for you to step out of your homes lest you be arrested and put in a jail filled with other people where you will surely get the virus if you don't have it yet. And so it was a time of fear, really, for many of us. And so when I sent them that message from Pagasa just to raise funds to bring survival packs to communities in most need, it was such a surprise to me and to the small group of friends, like four other women, who started working on Pagasa with me in March because the donations just came in in droves. And at some point, we, and in Two months or so, we were able to bring survival packs to 8,000 families. And that was no, no, it was such a major feat for us just because we were really just five women doing the work online, um, speaking mostly through Telegram. And it was just one Facebook page and one Instagram account. And yet, one also realizes that it was also about my integrity as a critic that allowed for people to actually donate to us instead of to any other instead of to any other organization there is right so it was also this community that just started being built among artists entrepreneurs cultural workers businesses filipinos from here and abroad which is a huge group of people as well um, and they just started sending us money and I realized that this was as much my performance of my civic duty, as much as it was their performance of it. Everyone wanted to do something to perform a civic duty in a time of crisis, especially in the face of a government that was a failure to do it. So it, was, it became this sort of collaborative performance without us really knowing it. Um, and then it became a way for us as well to tell stories. And I think this is how my performance as a critic has shifted. It has shifted to this almost um, creative writer, storyteller role where we realized early on that what was allowing people to choose us to give funds to or food or any donations in kind was the fact that every time we would tell them that, okay, we brought food to this community, we would include a story about that community. We would tell them about why we chose this community. We would tell them about the dream weavers in Mindanao. We would tell them about the women who had lost um, husbands and sons to the drug war. We would tell them about why the poor are so poor and why this community was chosen. And I think it's that kind of intimacy as well well, that allowed for this to continue even up to now five months into the pandemic. And it's really because people also want to know better about what's going on in nation. And it's those intimate stories that maybe they might have heard of before or maybe it was told to them in another form altogether but which now they are being told in a different voice and as i was telling corey and the team yesterday that's really still my voice and so it's really my performance of a specific critical voice that isn't so much about a cultural text that i'm reviewing as it is about nation and so that performance continues as a critic. Um, and it's really also a very 
tiring exercise. I'm not going to pretend it's easy. Um, I've never had to be so intimate as I have now. I've never felt like I needed to show my face anywhere. But half, I think when we were getting so many contributions, I felt it was important that people had a face to it. And one of the people in the core group, Leslie, a good friend of mine, had told me that from the start, that there was no way of doing something like Pag-asa without that form of intimacy where people actually have a face and a voice to it. And it was something that I was able to actually evade throughout the 10 years of being critic, where I always try and steer clear of panels and talks. And, you know, I keep saying, whatever I've written is already what I mean to say. So you don't need to talk to me anymore. Um, but suddenly it was necessary. Suddenly there were no, you know, conversations to be had in real life. Suddenly people, this massive collective of people that surrounded Pag-asa wanted to be able to see who it was, who was talking. And it became important that I draw upon whatever intimacy we could create out of just, you know, the computer screen and an IG video, right? Um, but also, it's really a shared intimacy among the core group. Um, this core group of four women are doing as much work as I am. I might be the one who's in front of you right now, but there's uh, Keisha and Anina who do the social media work are practicing intimacy just by talking to people on both those platforms. And it is as tiring as you can imagine it is um, because we're pretty much talking to strangers who are on the same page with us, who have a lot of questions, who want to help out and who want to know what else they can do at this point. Um, and then there's Leslie and CJ. CJ is the one who does the groundwork for us. And she works with all these activist organizations like Bayan Muna and Gabriela and the LGBT org Bahaghari. And they practice that intimacy. They're the ones who go down to the communities when I cannot, because I, I'm not that person who will risk getting the virus. And there are people who are far braver in doing that and who practice that whatever form of intimacy they can on the ground. And it's these people who actually are part of this collective that has no choice to, but to exercise that kind of intimacy with the communities that we help out. Um, and Leslie really is someone who is my anchor in terms of precisely just stepping back from that intimacy because it is tiring. And it's such a personal thing for me as a critic, precisely because what Pag-asa is able to do is draw from whatever integrity and credibility I have and whatever intimacies I have shared with people around me all these years. Um, and so it's now that I think about it, it's such a me, it's such a massive collective, really, of people that are making it move and that are making it continue to move at this point in time. And it's still that kind of intimacy and integrity that we draw from now as we shift to not just making sure that we're still sending out survival packs to people in most need and trying to help farmers with planting season, trying to help sustain certain communities by actually acquiring the produce that they make and bringing it to people who need it. But also um, in the kind of very personal, very intimate conversations that we're now having about nation and what it is we want to do at this point and where we want to go. I think there's a, an amount of intimacy required in being able to talk to people seriously uh, through the screens about what we should be doing in order for things to change. And certainly there is more credibility in being able to meet up with each other and being able to see each other but i'm learning that there is value as well in this kind of distance still that we keep through the screen and it forces me to appreciate as well those who aren't ready just yet to come out with their faces in a time of fear and repression um, that we are experiencing in this country and so this is the work of Pagasa, but also and of the massive collective that we've built around us. As much as it is my work as a critic and how it's just, I think it's just coalesced with the work of advocacy work and just civic duty. And I think I'll stop there. 
Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, I'm always so blown away by the work that you do. And that was such a rich sharing. I'm just thinking about so many intertwining threads that you shared about here um, when it comes to proximities of intimacy, because care work, um, care labor is really intense labor. These, the, the labors of, of communicating, of negotiating, of being the intermediary, of being um, the kind of yeah intermediary or interface um, who, who kind of connects people um, on the ground to uh, with donors who are giving to be um, the kind of communications person to answer questions, to address doubts. Um, and, and it really makes me think about, um, there's this paper I really like um, by James Thompson called Towards an Aesthetics of Care. And I think it really um, kind of blends together with your desire to see critique as, as a hopeful practice, as a practice of hope, because what do we imagine this world um, um, that we want to live in, right? How do we practice or model a kind of care work that could be the world that we want to strive for, that we hope for? Um, and what is more intimate than, than putting, I don't know, than, than a warm meal that will sustain someone um, and, and help and, you know, support people and keeping them um, alive and in, in this kind of solidarity. Um, I really, really like what you talked about when you, you were talking about criticism as a kind of performance practice. It reminds me of the work of another, um, uh, amazing uh, Filipino cultural worker and activist Donna Miranda. She calls herself a choreographer, um, but she choreographs protests. Um, she's a choreographer of bodies um, in movement when it comes to ag agricultural reform and land reform in the Philippines. And she's also been really active in doing work quite similar to, to what Pagasa is doing. But I also like thinking of the critic, um, not, not just as what you said, the, the analyzer of cultural texts, but the person who also questions governmentality, right? If we think of what Foucault or Judith Butler talk about critique, um, Foucault has this really memorable line of how he, he defines critique, which is the art of not being governed quite so much. And whenever I see you kind of question um, the Duterte regime, how, how much it has let the country down. And also I think the work um, I saw you posting about the anti-terror bill, what it means to be able to critique in a time like this. Um, I'm very struck um, by the power that comes from that. So thank you so much for sharing that. We can probably um, unpack this a little bit more in, in the Q&A as well. Um, thanks, Katrina. Uh, finally, we have um, Ria, and we'd love to hear from you. Ria, take it away. Thank you, Corey. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ria, and I am the founder and co-artistic director of Paper Moon Puppet Theater from Yogyakarta, Indonesia. I'm so happy tonight because I saw so many friends actually joining. Um, there are some other fellow puppetry artists from Netherlands as well as joining us. So thank you so much. Anyway, Corey and everyone Arts Equator Asia, thank you for having me. I know I'm the, I think I'm the only one that never met you, Corey. Am I right? Like, you, like three of you have been like having a really long relationship, but me I just like pop up with, hello, I'm Ria from Jogja. Anyway, so today I would love to share about what we've been doing in Paper Moon for this past five months, right after, um, you know, all everything's in our calendar were deleted. Like it's supposed to be have lots of colors and it becomes all white um, like everyone else. So the first time what, when it happened um, and when we realized that we, could, we won't do, we won't go anywhere, we, won't, we couldn't meet any of our schedules of performing. Um, I, think, I think this is the first, what do you call it? Um, I think this is the first thing that came up in our ideas because I think whoever lives in Jogja get in used to um, with uh, disaster. On 2006, just a month after I found Paper Moon, Jogja got hit by a gigantic huge earthquake and it made like thousands of people passed away, lots of like, like so many people lost their houses. Um, so in that day, we just, okay, what we can do, what we can do to help. Um, and then after that, like few years after that, there is a big eruption of Volcano Mountain in, in Yogyakarta. So as you imagine that like Jogja has this very interesting, um, you know, nature that, that makes us get in used to help others. I think that's, that's, the first, that's the first thing about being in Jogja. So the first time it ha of the pandemic happened and you know Indonesia said okay everyone stay at home everyone in the world stay at home 
And then these questions that come up in this screen was just the first questions that come up in our, in our head, in my head actually at that time. What can artists do in the time like this? And what is the role of artists in the society? And what could we do to help in our capacity as artists? I know there are plenty of artists uh, did the same thing in Jogja. I mean, did the same thing with, um, with Katrina actually. So lots of friends, they are making like collective kitchen and helping others and helping the farmers. Those, those happen instantly, like very fast. But in that time I was thinking like, okay, um, other people already help about the foods and everything. And since the day one, we always believed that art is foods for soul. So we found that in the same time, people are still consuming arts in another way. So, you know, like Netflix or any other like YouTube, whatever, it's people keep watching those like Korean drama, everything. So I found that, you know, there's of course a hunger for people uh, to be in other way, not just only a physical hunger, but then we found that that must be something that we can do to help the creativity to make it keep alive. Because we found that it's, it's the first way to, to, to build your immunity. It's your happiness. So can we go for the second slide, uh, Denise? Yep. So we decided to make this uh, starting on the 1st April 2020. We decided to make in this time. It's a series of talk with puppetry artists around the globe because we know that um, as Corey said, since 2008, uh, Paper Moon initiated an international Biennale puppet festival and it's an independent puppet festival. And then we found that, you know, lots of friends, they're just being locked, locked down in their own houses or apartment. So we decided to do this. We're supposed to do it for 14 uh, days and it's extended to 18 days. So the way was we just spread emails or news in our social media or information. We asked if you love to share about your works or you know we would love to interview you to ig live so can we go to the next uh, slide denise please thank you so much that's it like 18 artists every single day 2 p.m uh, gmt plus seven in jogja time we interviewed each of those artists from singapore thailand netherlands chile united states everywhere um even from serbia so lots of them i never met before some of them, of course, they are um, the participants of Pesta Boneca. But the point when we did this, like we connected to each other to I, through IG Live, we found that after we finished it, most of them sent me a message and said, Ria, thank you so much. This is like the first day that I'm, I'm thinking about my art after two months, for example. And that's make them alive again. That's make them okay, I can do this, you know, I would love to share this. I would love to do this. So they have an idea of, of just, you know, just, just do something, just do little thing and this keep them alive. And I found that this is, this becomes, oh, then, then here we are, you know, this is, this is how we try to keep the connection between, between the arts. And we're not talking about the, you know, the problems in pandemic at all in this session. We're just asking them question about their love to, to puppetry. And it's just amazing. Um, next, please. And then after that, we decided talking about intimacy. Uh, we found that, well, lots of people are, um, lots of our friends, which are artists or, you know, people who works in artwork, uh, art world, they swift their, their way of earning money from being an artist to making foods, for example, or making masks and sell it to people. And then we found that we found that, well, maybe in this time, what we can do is to make, it's really, it's about the intimacy that we would love to build with our audiences. So we decided to make Storyteller, which is we invite people, they can get the tickets, but they can give any theme they want. And then we would love to sue those themes, three or four themes to, to make as one performance. And then we will send it through their WhatsApp. Well, in the same time, lots of you know, friends are making works through YouTube, for example, and they say, but how if people grab that? How if people, you know, take those, <laughs> the cat? <laughs> how if, I know, how if, um, you know, like they're very anxious if their work gets stolen. But through this, we just really, we just send our performance to WhatsApp and each person can have their own performance. So we found that 
it's very interesting because we found it's all sold out as well in, in the time. So we found like, wow, people are really would love to would love to get their performance suit as well, you know, like, and I found it's very interesting that they can see their video through WhatsApp. I mean, it's just very simple and very accessible to anyone that, that doesn't require, you know, a long quota of internet, for example. And then after that, we also send those videos to um, health workers. We found that lots of people donate foods or or drinks or coffee, whatever, to those uh, health workers. But we found that they don't have time to be chill and then watching something made for them. So that's why we just, this is a performance for you, like five minutes length. So yeah, it's been amazing. Um, and next, and then from there, we decided to make this. We know that there is a possibilities of making, you know, it's just another experiment that it will be happen this weekend, August 1st and the 2nd. This will be our very first um, production, I can say. Uh, what, I, what we would love to try here is try things that we couldn't try on the real stage. So we really push our boundaries and questioning Oh, we can use fire because it's impossible to do it on stage. Oh, then we can do this and we can do that. So yeah, we just throw lots of crazy ideas to this production. Uh, next. And then, um, yeah, well, Kathy just sent the link of the YouTube of the trailer. And then, so these are the setup. The idea of the story taken from my five years old son, actually, because he's got obsessed with Beatles and we found that let's make something about about that and we found also it's very interesting um, that lots of performing arts happen online especially in Indonesia I know that Bernice is doing a Gerak ABC for the kids in Singapore but none none of artists in Indonesia making it for children so I found it's very interesting if this could be watched by a family you know and then you can discuss it so we choose we choose uh, we work with collaborate with um, a platform it calls pacar merah it's actually a lit literary uh, uh, festival and they already make a virtual festival as well so we kind of like we work with them and we use their platform um, so we can sell tickets and also share this production but we also would love to show um, the the audiences our backstage tour and also artist talk right after the show so we, we still would love to keep the intimacy in between you know artists and audiences um, in the plat in this platform for your information, every time Paper Moon's made production, we always, after it finished, we always invited audience to come on stage. They can touch the puppets, they can try, they can see all the secrets, they can hold, you know, you can try everything. So in this way, we would love to still, you know, share the same thing with, with the audience. And next, please. And that's the end. It's, I found that this is all coming back to the first reason why we are doing it and what for. I think this is the very main, why am I an artist while I couldn't perform? You know, Why am I a director where I couldn't make a live performance and meet the audiences? Um, and why you still become a puppeteer when you're, you couldn't make your production on stage? So I think it's everything is come back to the first reason. And I think, yeah, this is, this is what, what it means to me for these past five months. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ria, um, for that beautiful um, presentation. Um, I would I would encourage people to get tickets for a bucket of Beatles, but it's completely oh, no. um, But you can um, go take a look at Paper Moon Puppets on Instagram to get a sense of what the work is like. Um, what I really appreciate, I think, about your sharing is also, um, I think when, when you were talking about the different um, Kind of Instagram live sessions you held with these, you know, eighteen puppeteers and puppet groups from all around the world. That in that early part of the pandemic, when when you were asking exactly those kinds of existential questions about practicing um, the arts, right, the, the questions that you asked yourself right at the end, um, that you were actually um, facilitating a kind of reflexive process with all these other puppeteers from around the world, you know, getting them to think about actually what is my practice, why do I do what I do, and you know, given this time where where it's really difficult to to you know, kind of pivot and rethink my practice on the spot. Um, where is there a space where I can be asked questions and, and think through these processes? And in and in the process, you also built this kind of loose transnational um, kind of collective solidarity almost where, where people could kind of come online and, and see you um, interacting with puppeteers and practitioners yeah. 
Well, and sorry, actually, really. Corey, I just saw that um, there is one artist that actually joined in this time. At that time, there's Nofri Bahdim. He's from Netherlands and he's here now. So if you would love to ask him a question, what does it feel, you know, <laughs> to be interviewed in the pandemic situation in the beginning? And it's, you know, I mean, it's just like throwing questions to people. So maybe later he can just chat and, you know, yeah. sharing his experience with that. No, that's wonderful. I'm really glad that you've joined us today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be asking um, each of the panelists a couple more questions about what they just presented. But in the meantime, please um, share your questions with us, um, whether it's on the Facebook Live page um, or in the Zoom chat, and then we'll address them in a couple of minutes' time. Um, yeah, so I, I just had maybe one question for, for each of um, the participants to maybe deepen a little bit what you've uh, shared with us. So um, I think for maybe just starting with Ria because you've just uh, presented, um, I was actually thinking about this thing that you introduced for a bucket of beetles that I found really interesting because I don't think we quite have that in Singapore, which is that for your Indonesian audience members, um, they, you have something called barter trade where people can um, offer you or offer the group something um, in return for a ticket. And I thought that was such a wonderful way of interacting um, with audiences, but I do think that has also a bigger significance in Indonesia, right? This notion of, of kind of exchange in this way. I wonder if you could share that yeah. with us a bit more. Yeah, it's very interesting because um, we understand that not lots of artists can, can, you know, get the track easily, right? Like, it's very hard. It's very hard to learn this new medium for most of the artists as well. Um, in, it means that they don't have incomes um, for, for months, actually. So we understand that we, we still would love to make this uh, project available or, you know, like uh, for everyone. Um, we know that, you know, buying a quota of internet is already something, um, especially in Indonesia that not all of houses have, you know, internet system. So we found that um, there must be something, you know, so we, we, we give them two choices for the audiences for buying the tickets and, auto, and also the barter system, because we know that we know some friends that will need it. We know some people that will need it. They still would love to watch the show. They would love to also having this opportunity to have the same thing with the, with the one who can still pay the tickets. So it's, it becomes very interesting, um, uh, Corey, because we, found we had coconut oil arrive or lemon pie or books or embroidery artworks, drawings, um, uh, seeds of plants and it's amazing I, I just every time I, I read the email and see what people offer for the barter I keep saying yes yes we would love to do that because um, and it's not also be, it's not with the same value so I mean if it's ten dollar tickets but you don't have to give us something with ten dollar price you can you can give us whatever you can and you want and and that's the idea of of course like what, what, what do they think it's a similar value with the performance? And I found it's just amazing to see how yeah. people, you know, it's just beautiful. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, and I think it really, um, um, sorry, Kathy just shared with me, I think, and I agree with her, you know, the, this kind of system of exchange also really um, pokes some holes, maybe it doesn't operate outside it completely, but it pokes some holes about how we're commodifying the arts industry, you know, you pay kind of a certain value price or this, this work is, you have to kind of evaluate or assess how much your work is worth in terms of financial value. And here you've introduced a new dimension, I think, mm -hmm. to um, what it means to, to um, yeah, to, to, for the audience to give what they can, um, what is exactly. available. And also it's because, you know, it's the idea of what is the reason for you to make the production first, you know, like what is our first idea? It's to meet people, it's, it's to interact with them. So in this situation, there are plenty ways of doing that, right? I mean, and barter is one of it, I think. It's because the idea of making this production is to meet people, to interact with them and to keep the relationship as well. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a, uh, I have a question for Katrina. I know, I know you laugh when you talk about criticism as an act of hope, but it is true. And it's something I actually return to a lot. It's something that I remind myself as a, as a kind of critic and someone who's studying and researching criticism myself. Um, and I was wondering, I think, especially in your context, because I really feel the, the struggle that a lot of Filipino arts workers and cultural workers are facing. I mean, not just the cultural industry, of course, I think the, the country as a whole, especially now in the lockdown, 
um, how, how, what kind of avenues you give yourself to sustain this hope for you? Because I think you, you talked a little bit about how intimacy can put like huge strains on your emotional reserves, I think. Um, and it often maybe takes some kind of proximities of coming close and then going a bit further. But I'm wondering how you sustain and, and for the women, the other women who also work in Bagaza, what is it that sustains this hope for you? Oh, I think we, my own personal sense of hope comes from a very clear sense that things can be better. And I think that's even more clear now that things are so bad. And it might, now that you asked that question, it might be why I felt it was crucial to do this kind of civic work now because things are so terrible and so much of the injustice and the violence and incompetence has surfaced in the time of pandemic that now suddenly everyone is in agreement that everyone who's not drunk the cool aid is in agreement that we're in very deep shit and that we barely know how to get out of it but suddenly we're all on this we're all on the right side, on the same side of the fence. More of us are on that side. And that keeps me hopeful that there's a collective that actually appreciates the work that we've done for Pagasa, and that there's an even bigger collective that's looking at nation in a different way at this point, where it seems like people are also wanting to shift from just doing the civic duty of helping people out feeding people, getting PPEs to frontliners, etc., towards actually doing some major changes and affecting major changes within the systems that have brought upon this time. Not just of the virus, but also of just how terrible it is for everyone. And you see this in the cultural sector as well. And I think it's why, um, like Ria, I haven't felt like I needed to do something for the cultural sector because people very quickly rose to the occasion on that side. And I've just tried to help out where I can for specific needs. But I think the more privileged among the cultural sector have risen and have tried to help out, you know, like the theater people have been at the forefront of actually trying to help out all the production people and making sure that they're taken care of in this time of pandemic, except that it has stretched on for so long, especially in the Philippines, and there's no end in sight given the lack of governance. And so it's also at the point where even when we're all quite fearful, we're also all very angry. Um, and that gives me hope, how strange to say it now, but <laughs> the, the collective anger, I think, gives me hope. I don't think we've been this angry, and I don't think I've felt a collective around the same issues um, in the past four years as I have now. Um, as a critic, as a, as a, in terms of my work as a cultural critic, I haven't really written much um, separate from the work for, for Pagasa. Um, I continued teaching because there's online classes. Um, much of the writing I've done is for Pagasa, which to me is still writing. It doesn't, it isn't like the criticism that we all that we do. Um, but I've been gl I've gladly been forced to do stuff for CNN Philippines and for Arts Equator when necessary. <laughs> when I can't say no, when it's an interesting enough subject matter, then yes. Um, I also am very, and I think I failed to mention this earlier, I'm very aware of the kind of privilege that I have to be able to do this work and to not be not yet be one of those people in need of assistance. Um, and so I think that kind of privilege also allows for an amount of perspective in terms of um, how much I complain or how much I'm allowed to complain. And my tendency is to not to complain because I know that things can be worse and things are worse for many others and for a majority in this country. And that also keeps me going, I think. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I can. I, I really appreciate your sharing. I think, oh, I, I, I resonate very deeply with what you shared. I think 
um, also in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, so there were a couple of mutual aid platforms that arose in Singapore and many artists and, and especially the literary sector, I think, um, rallied behind these mutual aid platforms. And we had something called Book Fair for Wares that I was also a part of um, to raise uh, funds for, for really an, an kind of relentless stream of people who had really fallen through the safety nets in Singapore, fallen through the cracks, been completely overlooked. And you really feel a sense of urgency that if you don't give, someone's going to go hungry. You know, how can you live with that kind of, um, I think it's also the collective anger <laughs> that I, and I feel from you that kind of, that does also keep people um, um, going. So I think there are two things, two strands at, at work here, you know, what, what can be done to sustain the cultural industry that is often um, very precarious, um, you know, not to, uh, to really overlook or understate the precarity of the art sector with the others closed and, and really um, artists having to make a huge pivot and change to look at digital mediums in a more focused way. And also with the work that you're doing, which is sustain kind of the livelihoods of, of, of a huge community of people who have been let down by the state and other kind of support systems. So I think we do see that in both Ria and, and, and Katrina, your work. So I appreciate kind of both strands of, of approaching. And I um, think piggybacking very quickly on what Ria said earlier about just the barter thing. I think it's also the kind of thing that many of the artists who have raised funds for Pag-asa themselves without us asking for it, um, that's really also what they're working with. The idea they're really just selling to their very small group of friends as well. And it's a very, it's a very intimate community of people buying each other's stuff at this point and trying to sustain each other and for the more privileged among them donating whatever they can. And so we've become part of that cultural um, system as well. And so I also would like to bring that in, that it is a very cultural kind of um, intimacy. It's a cultural sector intimacy actually also that's being practiced, I think, across all the, especially Ria's work, I think, yeah. and Pagasas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. I actually ha have a, I have a question for Bernice, but someone also asked a very similar question. So I think we'll kind of now that oh, we only have about fifteen minutes left. I'm going to start taking in the audience questions that have come in. So this is um, a question similar to what I wanted to ask Bernice um, from the audience, um, which is uh, kind of looking at uh, uh, intimacy. Um, on stage, how to stage intimacy specifically. So the question is, what about intimacy in our performing industry? Uh, for example, negotiating intimate physical contact on stage, um, in class with students, or in rehearsal involving colleagues, um, all this in light of the sea changes the performing world has had to cope with in the aftermath of the Me Too movement. Um, what are your reflections about responsible practices of intimacy in digital spaces? And because I think this overlaps quite closely with, with the work that Bernice does, I was wondering if I could, maybe you want to address that question first and then if Ria and Katrina want to that that's great as well. Mm. Thanks Corey and thanks Chris. I also saw your earlier question and maybe I will type an answer or something or maybe everyone else wants to answer it as well. Um, but for this question about responsible practices I think there are um, quite a number of considerations. Um, firstly to never to assume that what we want is the same as what someone else wants. Um, I think it also depends on context though, so I am trying to wrap my head around this. Um, but I think the first thing is to, re to really be clear that my assumptions for myself are different from your assumptions for you. Um, I think that a lot of times people who set the agenda, so for instance in this case, um, Arts Equator sets the agenda, they set up the meeting and you know, they, they, they are the ones who provide guidelines. I think the people who set the agenda giving as much clarity as they can about what they expect um, helps in terms of staging these intimacies um, so that everybody can have a sense of safety or to exit if they don't feel comfortable. Um, I think it's a bit tricky. I'm trying to think of more specific examples. Um, maybe something I can think about is, for instance, I have a roly-poly family project where we're working with children um, between Singapore and Sydney. And one of the th two of the things that we're doing is they, um, they have this kind of pen pal system. Although children these days, they didn't, none of them knew what a pen pal was. 
one of them knew what a pantel was. Um, and basically, they trade these dance videos of themselves. Um, and we had to be really careful about content um, for the child and also for, for the parents to be aware. Um, we use an app that is, um, that's called Wire and it's super, super secure. Um, we make sure that they understood certain guidelines about how they can behave um, in the videos and how they should use the um, um, messaging system. And um, as the facilitator, I, we are also, um, each of the facilitators are also very present in the chat group. Um, so we can kind of have a sense of like whether they're using this in a responsible way. So that's one of the examples that I can give in terms of specificity. Um, I think it's always a bit tricky because um, it also depends on which format and media we use. So for instance, the, for, for Garak ABC, we thought about whether we would do Facebook Live, YouTube Live, um, IG Live, you know. Each thing has, has its own set of rules, how long it stays there. Um, but we decided to go with Zoom so that it ends and then it's over. And I think it's the same with Touch You Later. We decided that it only lives on for that period of time. We carry what it is with ourselves. It doesn't leak out. It doesn't bleed out. Any, we only took like maybe 10 pictures for archival reasons. And I didn't even share them in this, in this particular panel um, because we said we would not um, use those images except for archives. So there are these kinds of questions um, that we think about. Um, yeah, I, I'll just stop there. Thanks, Bernice, for sharing. Um, we have a couple more questions. Um, I think we have time to take two or three of them. So from Wei Liang on Facebook, um, and, and feel free um, for all the panelists to answer. Um, now that we can no longer meet in person as freely as we used to, what challenges do you all face in checking in on how audience members and your artistic collaborators, or maybe in Katrina's case, your fellow collaborators, are feeling? Um, are there any new strategies that you have taken to better sense their shifting emotional boundaries, even from afar? I'm just going to repost it in the chat so you can refer to it. Are we waiting for each other? <laughs> um, I think we're all being forced to shift to just being humans. Um, we, for, for the core group of women who run Pagasa, it's really just a lot of sending each other food, making sure we're okay. Um, it's, it's all very, uh, it's, it has absolutely nothing to do with the work that we do for Pagasa and more of how you maintain a relationship in a time when you can't see each other. Um, and I think that's part of the intimacy also that we keep among ourselves. These five, these four women actually don't know each other. They, they, I'm the one that put them together into this group. And so um, whatever relationships that have been formed is really born still of such a, of that clear project that is Pag-asa that we want to do. I think the intimacy that I have been more surprised by is how, for example, this community in Marikina that has been on lockdown and has, um, has a uh, is made up of a community of jeepney drivers who have been disallowed from going back to work by government, how they've lost their homes and because they have no way to pay rent, etc. How they have slowly tried to figure out how to earn a little um, and how to rise from the ashes of the pandemic. And so when they started cooking food and tried trying to sell that food, they surprised me and my mom with like a massive feast about a weekend ago. And it was such a surprise because I, it wasn't something that we at any point asked for. We're, we, be, precisely because we're aware of our privilege. Um, my tendency is for, is to say, don't send us anything. Just, you know, just bring it back to that community. But that kind of intimacy, I think with food is an interesting thing that's been happening in in the, in the Philippines. It, it's really our way of trying to reach out even to people that we don't know. Um, I've done it for a bunch of cultural workers who I know are in need maybe because they're sick or um, they take care of parents or just, you know, they, they haven't been able to find their footing 
And so every time there's extra cash, we send them a box of food. And it's something that I feel is an intimate act just because it's sustenance and it's survival. Um, and so it, it's if that is the audience, then it's an audience that we maintain by keeping them alive. And I think that has become the most crucial thing for all of us at this point in the cultural sector. And it takes a lot of work to try and, you know, message friends who seem to be on the brink and to try and get them to say, yes, I need help. Um, and so, so it's, a, it's still that practice of intimacy, I think. Well, for me, I think um, the number one that it's very interesting, it's not it's not actually only questioning about the audience members, but how the artists get deal with the medium, because it is a very different medium. I, you know, like directing a live performance and directing this production that we will, that we will publish on this August as a world premiere. We found that, oh my gosh, how can I do this? Like 14 years I've been making a live puppetry performance on stage. And right now it's just, what is this eyes of camera doing, <laughs> you know? Like the editing part, the scoring music. And I found that, wow, this is very interesting. So the first thing is I keep remember that there was one day when I went to, uh, I got a, me and my husband got the grant to, to do a residency in United States with Asian Cultural Council. And then at that time we went to see Avatar um, uh, scene in, in theater, like <laughs> movie, like Hollywood movie. And then I found why I could cry watching Avatar, but it's very, very few times. I couldn't even count. Maybe I never could experience a touchy theater productions. And in that part, I, I got that films or some things on screen could do something better than stage sometimes. So that's in that, in that position, I could, what we can do when we are doing a bucket of Beatles, we keep questioning what this medium can do for the audience and for the artist. Um, many of artists, they just, you know, make a documentation and then, and then share it through um, like screen. And I found that, no, it's very different. It's, it's, a, it's a different way of working with this tiny screen, you know, because the audience have a limitation of physicality. Um, you're not, you're not experience anything, everything on your body because you just, you know, looking at the screen, right? Um, except, you know, um, Bernice, you're doing the movement and the kids, it's really active, active situation. But most of the production of performing arts on screen, audience just sit still. So I found that, wow, there's so many things that we can explore with that. Um, so I think that that's the number one challenges as an artist that get deal with the medium, that a very, very new medium. Something that we've been, people have been doing for 20 years, 30 years, and suddenly now in five months, you have to learn new things. And, you know, but I also saw that there are many um, possibilities on it. Like for Bucket of Beatles, people bought from many different parts of the world. So it's borderless. You don't need flight tickets to watch Paper Moon's productions. And I found that where else, when else we can do this? You know, I need to be, you know, Esplanade or, you know, other places need to invite Paper Moon to go to Singapore. So for the Singaporean audience can watch the show. But this time, no. So it's, I think it's very, very interesting, you know, like, yeah. I think that's that's the new strategy that I think there are plenty, plenty things that we can learn from this new medium, actually, honestly. Thank it's you so much for sharing on it. Um, I, I'm aware that we actually only have one minute left ah! to talk about really? <laughs> for this panel. I think it's been such a rich discussion. Um, there are so many more kind of questions and comments. Um, I hope it's okay. We're just gonna maybe extend it by about five more minutes. Just hang in there for five more minutes for us to kind of wrap up um, everything that's come in. I'm, I'm seeing in the comment section that there are other kind of um, similar questions around um, what it might feel like to um, have a really kind of huge online audience compared to smaller black box spaces is one of the comments. There are also comments about technology. Um, 
about what it, um, someone, uh, Max commented on Facebook, um, that if we believe that tech will remain the major medium for interaction, we might need to research and experiment more on the possibilities of technology. Um, and Chris has also brought up that um, we have a once in a generation opportunity to kind of share these protocols and translate um, in them the language of accessibility. So there are a couple of comments um, around tech and also about audience uh, uh, kind of how, how do you build that connection and relationship with, a, with an online audience? Um, I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to all of them, but um, we can see if perhaps we can answer them on, on Facebook comments, perhaps. Um, but I think just to wrap up this incredible um, um, sharing you know, from, from Manila, from Dukta, from here in Singapore, um, I think it really looks like we are developing a new kind of vocabulary um, around intimacy, but at the same time also paying attention to what it is that sustains intimacy in the first place, right? That we are all bound together by these very, very tightly knit interpersonal connections that we've had to draw on even more during this period um, and that can expand into the boundlessness or the borderlessness that Ria talked about, but also sustain uh, ground up kind of civic actions in the way that Katrina talked about. And that things, um, uh, intimacy doesn't vanish in an online space, that but must be kind of paid even more attention to these kinds of interactions and consent that Bernice brought up. Um, and, and I'm thinking about, um, just to close um, this incredibly rich uh, conversation, I was thinking about this quote I, I read by one of my favorite theorists. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm an academic, so this just comes up. <laughs> but one of my favorite theorists is Sarah Ahmed, and she, she deals a lot with affect and emotion and intimacy and, and how we can be together in this world. And she talks about um, this notion of inter-embodiment, that we are not just our bodies, but the way we are in the world is also constituted by the people who are around us, right? Our bodies are imprinted on by others and we imprint onto them as well. That in fact, our bodies don't just belong to us, but they open up our intimacies, um, the in intimacy of yourself with others. Um, um, that's a quote, you know, my, in that sense, my body does not belong to me. Embodiment is what opens up the intimacy of myself with others. And I think in all the sharings today, we've seen how um, practitioners have opened, I think, their body in many different ways, um, whether it's through activating their cultural networks and sustaining artistic practice, into sustaining the livelihoods of peoples and communities overlooked by the state, um, of, you know, trying to facilitate and build in touch in a time that we are so touch starved, especially during the lockdown periods, um, what are these ways in which artists and practitioners are activating these moments of intimacy, but with deep integrity and respect for the work that they do. So um, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. A huge round of applause um, to all um, our our wonderful panelists, um, please uh, follow them on all their social media accounts that um, Nabila and Kathy have posted in the chat. And I'm now going to hand over the time to Nabila, who's the editor of Arts Equator, to just kind of close it. Thank you, Corey. Um, I feel like I need to give myself a hug and everyone a hug in this room. Um, but just very quickly to wrap up, next week is our last uh, Burning Questions panel. Uh, and it's a very hot topic of can critics crit criticize during a pandemic? Um, and, and I'll actually be moderating that panel uh, and I'll be joined by Singapore critics Lu Zehan, Jocelyn Cheng, Theo Xiaoting and Jermin Cheng as well. So I think that's very exciting and do join us for our very last Burning Question series. Um, and also just a very quick reminder of our Art Equator online reviewing course that's happening. So our theater reviewing and books reviewing courses, um, applications are still open. So do check out uh, artsequator.com as well as our social media pages. Uh, with that, I think I'll just thank everyone for joining us and do uh, have a great night. Yeah, thank you.